Thanks for the poor. Good afternoon, brothers and sisters. So the theme for the devotions this week, God willing, is going to be based around praying for the kingdom, as Brother Luke explained last night. And you may have noticed on the programme that we've each been given verses to base these around. I'll get to mine in a minute. But really this one's also going to be a bit of an introduction to the theme for the rest of the week of praying for the kingdom. And I thought in the ten minutes that we have, we'll very briefly think about three things. Why do we pray? How often should we pray? And why should we pray for the kingdom? In the context mainly of private prayer, but I guess we can also apply this mostly to public prayer as well. So I'm sure most of us have a pretty good idea in our heads of why we pray. Prayer is our form of communication with the Father, through which we offer praise, ask petitions, confess sins, and more besides. It's something which we can do very reverently, very humbly, very frequently, for a wide variety of reasons. And I'll just quote a couple of verses to remind ourselves of some significant passages. We know from James chapter 5, that the effectual, fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. We know from Psalm 34 that Yahweh is nigh unto those that seek him. And we know from 1 John 5 that God hears whatever we ask and will respond if it's in accordance to his will. And we could go on, obviously, but I thought it might be useful just to remind ourselves those very quickly as to the significance of prayer. But how frequently should we practice prayer? Well, 1 Thessalonians 5 verse 17 simply says, pray without ceasing. And we know that that can't mean we should pray 24-7, because that's impractical, and there'll be no other time for the rest of our service and the truth. But I think it does mean that we should adopt a regular, frequent, and uninterrupted prayer pattern, prayer life. And in Psalm 55, verse 17, which is our verse for this morning, that's exactly what we get. So if you have a Bible to hand, turn there, please. Psalm 55. That's why we don't have a doorkeeper. Psalm 55, verse 17. And Psalm 55 is a very interesting psalm of David, clearly written in a time of distress, as many Davidic psalms were. And we'd suggest this one was written at a time when Ahithophel, David's close friend and counselor, betrayed him and confided with Absalom in his revolt against David. Um, and if you just go into verse 14, David's clearly referring to Ahithophel here. Um, verse 14, we took sweet counsel together and walked unto the house of God in company. Let death seize upon them, let them go down quick into hell, for wickedness is in their doings and among them. But it's verse 15 and 16 that's of particular interest to us. Verse, sorry, verse 16 and 17. As to me, I will call upon God and the Lord shall save me. Evening and morning, and at noon, will I pray and cry aloud, and he shall hear my voice. So evening, morning, and noon, three times a day. This is the prayer pattern that David adopted, and I think it's one that we would do well to replicate as a minimum in terms of our prayer life. And of course, the Jewish day started at sunset, about, about six o'clock in the evening. So obviously, for us, it's the equivalent of a morning noon and evening prayer and private prayer is obviously a very private thing to talk about but I wonder maybe if the noon prayer might be the easiest one for us to neglect in a normal everyday busy working life it's probably slightly easier to establish a routine of praying in the morning and in the evening but with distractions at work or maybe a short lunch break or whatever reason I don't know it might be more difficult for us to remember to pray at noon. But this week is not a normal week, even for those who are working or camping. We have the blessing of a a virtual kingdom conference, and we have a devotion at noon every day this week, God willing. And if we can get into the habit of listening to these, whether we work or not, I think it's an excellent habit for us to get into, setting our mind on spiritual things in the middle of the day. I said a few moments ago, as a minimum. So I just want you also to come across to Psalm 119. Because Psalm 119, I would also strongly suggest as a Psalm of David. 
and one that was written probably when he was quite young. And it gives us very interesting insight as to how David spent his time when he was a young man. So I'm just going to pick out a few verses of Psalm 119, see what you notice in these. So verse 164, seven times a day do I praise thee because of thy righteous judgments. Verse 97, O how love I thy law, it is my meditation all the day. Verse 148, Mine eyes prevent the night watches, that I might meditate in thy word. Verse 62, at midnight will I rise to give thanks unto thee, because of thy righteous judgments. Verse 55, I have remembered thy name, O Lord, in the night, and have kept thy law. Verse 147, I invented the dawning of the morning, and cried, I hoped in thy word. And I think that's absolutely wonderful because it demonstrates that the psalmist is constantly engaged and stimulated in spiritual things throughout the day, throughout his waking hours, even stretching into the night. Obviously, it's a psalm that shows a love of God's word primarily above anything else. But a love of God's word will naturally lead us to be more spiritually minded people. Our minds are always going to be shaped by what we feed them. So David was a man who filled his day and his time with spiritual things and had this prayer pattern of at least three times a day. And of course, there's one other man who famously prayed three times a day, which of course is Daniel. So turn please to Daniel chapter 6. Remember the story in Daniel chapter 6 of how King Darius signed a decree that was designed to stop or to prevent anybody praying to any god or man, it says in verse 7. For 30 days, else they'd be cast into a den of lions. And in verse 10, we get the remarkable example of Daniel. Daniel 6, verse 10. Now when Daniel knew that the writing was signed, he went into his house, and his windows being opened in his chamber toward Jerusalem, he kneeled upon his knees, three times a day, and prayed, and gave thanks before his God, as he did a four time. That really is a remarkable verse, but for one thing, three times a day, as he did a four time, Daniel was in a routine of praying three times a day, and did he let the prospect of being cast into a literal den of lions stop him in that? No, he didn't, and I think that's a very powerful example for us to aspire to, if Daniel can pray three times a day in that situation, then surely so can we. But we're also told in that verse that he prayed with his windows open toward Jerusalem. Now, why would he do that? Is he being pharisaical or trying to prove a point? I, I don't think he is. Of course he isn't. I think the answer lies in 1 Kings chapter 8. Because, remember, Darius may be a me. But this is still in Babylon. Darius was made king over Babylon. And Daniel and his fellow Jews are still in captivity. And if you were to read 1 Kings 8 verses 44 to 53, I think we get the answer. And it's also a passage that links very nicely to Daniel's prayer in Daniel chapter 9. But I'll just read a few verses, maybe starting at verse 47. And just notice the application to Daniel's situation. So 1 Kings 8, verse 47. Yet if they shall bethink themselves in the land whither they were carried captives, and repent and make supplication unto thee in the land of them that carried them captives, saying, We have sinned and have done perversely, and have committed wickedness, and so return unto thee with all their heart and with all their soul in the land of their enemies, which led them away captive, and pray unto thee toward their land, which thou gavest unto their fathers, the city which thou hast chosen, and the house which I have built for thy name, then hear thou their prayer and their supplication, in heaven thy, in heaven thy dwelling place, and maintain their cause, and forgive thy people that have sinned against thee, and all their transgressions wherein they have transgressed against thee, and give them compassion before they who have carried them captive, that they may have compassion on them. So very simply, surely Daniel was praying towards Jerusalem, because of this passage, because of what Solomon said in his prayer and the principles behind it. 
I said, there are many links between Solomon's prayer and Daniel's prayer in Daniel chapter 9. But basically, I think Daniel prayed toward Jerusalem because he was praying primarily that the captivity may return to Jerusalem. And that leads us nicely on to the last thing I wanted to mention, because we are also strangers and pilgrims in the earth, and we too should be praying with our minds towards Jerusalem, praying for the return of Christ to this earth to establish the kingdom, a time when God will bring again the captivity of Israel and Judah back to the land. And in the Lord's Prayer, the example prayer of Jesus, he says to his disciples, Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, in earth as it is in heaven. Jesus taught us to pray for the kingdom. And I believe that in praying for the establishment of the kingdom age, we are expressing our desire for God's plan and purpose to be achieved, our gratitude for being called according to his purpose as well. Praying for the kingdom will also help us to keep that kingdom vision burning bright in our minds, and God's will should be the mark in our foreheads. And if we can achieve this prayer pattern of Psalm 55, evening, morning, and at noon, when I pray and cry aloud, then I think that will help us to that end, and our minds will naturally focus on the kingdom more. And of course, when it is in accordance with God's will, our prayers for the kingdom will be answered, and Christ will return to reign in Jerusalem, and we pray that we will reign with him as kings and priests. And I'm sure all of this will be covered in more detail throughout the week. But thank you all for this.